Hello, I'm doing this video to help people understand that when they do their recording sessions with me on Zoom, or if they're getting readings by any other method, there's a, often a confusion between tropical astrology and Vedic astrology. But I like to uh, kind of cover this because it's a bit confusing for people. Often people hear that they have a sun sign in whatever sign it is in tropical astrology and a rising sign and a moon sign, and it will totally change in Vedic astrology. Now, just FYI, Vedic astrology is kind of a pop term. Its real name is called Jyotisha. In fact, a friend of mine, Chakrapani, might have coined that phrase back in the 60s. He passed away now. But uh, he called it Vedic astrology because he didn't know if people would understand the meaning of Jyotisha. Jyotisha actually means the science of the light of the soul or spirit. And in my opinion, it truly is. There's many branches of Vedic astrology. There's Maharishi Parsharas. There's also Maharishi Jaimini. And then the older systems, I believe, are Nadi astrology. And many people may have heard of the Nadi palm leaves. So Jyotisha or Vedic astrology will often completely change your birth chart. Here's a good example. I have the United States birth chart up here, and you can see the United States has the sun in Cancer. And for anyone who doesn't know, this where I'm circling right now is a little um, symbol meaning Cancer. And the United States has a Sagittarius birth time rising uh, or birth uh, uh, sign rising, and also the moon is in Aquarius. So that's usually what most modern astrologers focus on, is the rising sign, the sun sign, and also the moon sign. But we're going to see here in a few minutes that it's much deeper than that. Now, notice the same birth chart in Vedic astrology, which often looks like this. This is the northern Indian chart. The sun is not in Cancer anymore. It's back in Gemini. That's the sign of Gemini. The moon is in Aquarius, very early degrees, and it's not Sagittarius rising anymore. It's Scorpio rising. So the reason for this is there is about a 24 degree approximate difference between the tropical zodiac and the so-called sidereal zodiac. Western astrologers typically use a system called the tropical zodiac, which is based on the equinoxes and the solstice point. And of course, equinox is a Latinized term that simply means the days and the nights are equal. The spring and the fall equinox are very powerful times of the year. Also, we have the longest day of the year, the summer solstice, and of course, the shortest day of the year, the winter solstice. And that's because the sun goes south and north of the ecliptic during those times. So that system is probably going to be, meaning the tropical, the system you're familiar with. And again, modern astrologers tend to run around and call everyone their astrology. And we'll see here very shortly that that may not be the case. So Vedic astrology takes into account something known as the procession of the equinoxes. That means our solar system is believed to go around a central sun just short of 26,000 years. No one's completely sure, but a lot of people put it somewhere around 25,700 and something odd years for the great year of our solar system to go around the central sun. So this is an exceedingly long time, and it's believed we spend somewhere around 2,100 years in a sign. And many people have heard, oh, we're entering the age of Aquarius, and many astrologers believe we're in it already. I actually don't, but we'll leave that one alone. So the bottom line is, this is why Western tropical astrology is probably going to have you at a different sun sign, rising sign, or moon sign. Some, some planets will stay the same if they're within 24 degrees. But um, the, the, the main thing that I'm trying to point out here is that your Vedic astrology uses a sidereal zodiac, which will be 24 degrees different from what a modern Western astrologer might refer to you as. This brings me to the next thing. People say, okay, great, I get that issue, that one is using a tropical zodiac, the other one's using the sidereal zodiac. But which one is more accurate? Well, I have to say my experience is they both are. 
And um, maybe a simpler way to look at this is the tropical zodiac shows the external veneer of us more kind of in analogy where the rubber hits the road or where we interact with the physical plane, whereas the sidereal or Vedic astrology shows more the path of the soul. You can actually see this etheric energy leaving death to rebirth and, of course, on and on over the hills. So many people do not believe in reincarnation, and many people do. Um, there's some pretty good evidence that there is reincarnation, but I'm not here to sell anybody on anything. So the bottom line is that is really the clear difference between Vedic astrology, or you could say Jyotisha, and Western tropical. The Vedic astrology is more the path of the soul, where the tropical also is, and many people will get upset that I said that, but you can also see the path of the soul with tropical astrology, but I find it's much more externalized. So there are many things in the readings that I do where we talk about cycles, which are called doshas or time periods, progressions, and also very complex transit yogas that will be defined in the reading. So I like to point that out real briefly so that people are understanding this. Now, there's one more very important topic that I want to get into, and that is the glyphs of the planets. Many people in the Judeo-Christian religion have seen something known as the tree of life. Now, the tree of life is one easy way to explain this. All the planetary glyphs come from the circle of the sun, which is also considered the seed, the moon, which is the crucible, and the cross, which is spiritual manifestation. In fact, if you look at the glyph of the sun, the dot in the middle can be likened to God, and the circle is the never-ending creational cycles that everything goes through. Everything starts out as a beginning, an idea, a seed, an embryo. It grows, it matures, it atrophies, and it dies. Nothing escapes that. So the sun could be likened to the seed of creation. Well, we know dad puts the seed where in the mother's womb and or just like the farmer puts the seed in the ground and it nurtures and it grows. And of course, when it's ready for manifestation, of course, in a human being sense, it exits the womb of the mother and ends up on the physical plane of the four elements. And it's also believed that the angel ties the spirit, psyche and soul to the body permanently at first breath. We'll get into that one a little bit later, some theologies on that. So most astrologers, especially the Egyptians and the Vedic, knew that it was first breath when spirit became manifest. Also, what's important in your reading, you're going to notice, I'm also going to get into something called location astrology. And this is where the cross and the glyphs of the planets really shine. In fact, we know the eastern horizon is sunrise, right? Noon is where the midheaven is directly over the top of us. And sunset is where something called the descendant is. And where the sun is at midnight, the bottom of the cross is known as the nadir or I see depending on which astrologer you speak to. Now, in location maps, you're going to find that these become extremely important. You'll see over here, even though it's out in the middle of the Pacific, that is AS, which means ascending. That's a Mars ascending line. So if someone were to be on that line, um, you would find that that would be very personal because that's what the Eastern horizon or ascendant represents. The MC nomenclature means the energy of that planet is manifest in career. See, the MC is a Latinized term called median coli, which actually means where the sun is at noon and also the 10th house of career. So anytime you see in your location maps, MC or AS, that either means personal for AS or career for MC. Now, the DS nomenclature is where the sun descends. Hence, whatever planet you see, if it has a DS underneath it or above it on the bottom of the map, it will literally mean partnerships and relationships. And then the final one is the IC. That's kind of a strange Latinized term, again, mean immune coli, which really should be just the nadir or where the sun is at midnight. And any planet on the IC rules 
or emphasizes home, family, and real estate. So we begin to see how important the cross, the sun, and the moon are. They are really central to all of the planetary energies. And here's how we can go down the rabbit hole a little bit deeper. You will also notice that Saturn is the cross over the crescent of the moon. That's why Saturn represents previously concretized, or you could say solidified habit patterns or karmas. Us in the West tend to think karmas are all bad, but you can also have good karmas, right? So it's previously solidified energies, and Saturn may be the karmic gunny sack we drag around from lifetime to lifetime to lifetime. So its glyph is the cross where previously manifest energies are now stored, ready to come to fruition. In fact, many of the ancient Nadi and Vedic astrologers said Saturn may be the purpose of this incarnation. So one of the next things we get into is Jupiter. Jupiter is exactly flipped and opposite of Saturn. It is the crescent of the moon over the cross. It's like a divine parabolical dish scooping up the divine energy and concretizing it into your life. That's why Jupiter may in fact be the blessings upon the soul. It's not only the largest planet in the solar system, but clearly represents spiritual expansion and buoyancy and wonderful things. Hence, it is called the blessings or life force energy on the soul. You'll notice here on the screen, there's a little word called jiva. That is kind of a Sanskrit or Hindi word that means blessings or the uh, life force energy of the soul. Venus is the sun over the cross. And of course, it rules art, creativity, love and passions, desires, wealth, marriages, unions, all that type of thing. Mars, the ancient symbol, was the cross over the sun. Now, you'll notice on many modern astrology programs and on the maps that Mars is an arrow, which shows its impetuousness or its intensity. But the ancient symbol actually truly was the cross over the sun. So it rules the ego, the will, the drive, the energy. Even in the chakras, it rules the crown chakra where the life force energy enters into the body. So very powerful. Mars lines are always aggressive and they have tons of energy. So going on here to finish the glyphs of the planets, the last one of the inner seven is Mercury, the crescent of the moon over the sun, over the cross. So Mercury always represents intuitive logic and reason and intellect. It also rules communications and all those things that are mercurial. So Mercury is, again, the swiftest planet in the solar system next to the moon. So it always represents the mind and the intellect and the swiftness of thought. So you see now how all the planets are combinations of the seed of creation, the crucible, and the spiritual manifestation on the physical plane. Now, people will often say to me, yeah, but what about the outer planets, right? What about the modern ones? Well, take a look at that. Uranus is the two crescents of the moon bent outwards with the cross in the middle over the sun. Uranus is truly the eclectic genius. It's also the disruptor or the changer. And in astronomy, we find Uranus literally orbits 180 degrees on its side, and no astronomer drawing breath can tell you why. It certainly doesn't seem to be gravity. So it's very mysterious. And Uranus is a bit enigmatic and serious about its eclectic ways and disruptions. So that's, again, combinations of the sun and the moon and the cross, the circle, crescent, and cross. Look at Neptune. Neptune is the crescent of the moon bent upwards over the cross. In fact, many people will say Neptune is kind of intuitive and psychic and spiritual. Well, you can see this big thick dash line here. This is the demarcation between what modern psychology might refer to or psychiatry as the conscious mind below this big thick dash line and the so-called subconscious mind above. But a better metaphor might be this is the present personality or our perception of reality. And this up above might be the spirit psyche and the soul. So in the karmic energy of 
Saturn. So Neptune tends to be the portal or intuitiveness between the spiritual planes and the lower reality. And then last, we have the pl planet Pluto. Now, I know many people have heard Pluto has been demeaned from a planet, but I can tell you my experience in astrology is Pluto is quite powerful. Um, it seems to change the face of society every time it makes hard aspects to very powerful planets. And of course, Pluto's glyph is the sun over the crescent of the moon over the cross. So it is also indicative of raw power. Some people will liken that off also to the upper circle known as the divinity of the soul, which is up here. So these that's a brief treatise on the glyphs of the planets and many people have different versions of it but that's the ones i use they're more ancient and i like it and i hope it helps you during your reading because it gives you a little bit of a feel for understanding and the sacredness and also the etymology of where this stuff came from one last thing that we'll dive into and that is the whole enigma of astrology. Many astrologers will tell you, you are your astrology. You are your sun sign. I think nothing could be further from the truth. And I think this diagram depicts that best. This is known as the simplified four worlds of creation. Whatever your concept of God is, unless you're an atheist, God is always some higher power. And many people have different opinions of what God is. We'll leave that one alone and just let that to everyone's own free will. So God is above creation. It is believed that our soul is created right here. This is a world called absolute. And in Aramaic and Hebrew, that means where the divine emanation of souls happen. Very divine stuff. These are the classes of angels that are believed to rule it, the seraphims, cherubims, and the thrones. They believe that there's, 20, there's 49 parallel dimensions up here and 49 sub-dimensions in these worlds. Now, no one can prove it or disprove it, but I believe that that's true. So this is exceedingly vast. And most importantly, there's no astrology up here. There's no rotating galaxies and Pisces and Aries and sun signs up here. This is very divine stuff. You could refer to it as the upper halls of heaven. The next worlds down, Briya, is where the waters of creation get much more dense. And it's believed there's many vast worlds in here. And these are the classes of angels that are believed to rule it, the dominance, virtues, and powers, or the main, major angels. And again, they say there's 49 dimensions and 49 subdimensions, exceedingly vast. It's way down here, hundreds of dimensions below where your soul is believed to be created, known as the worlds of Yetzirah or the Yetzeratic worlds. Yetzirah is a strange word that means formation. And this is where it's believed the rotating galaxies, the uh, amino acids, the molecular structures and lower densities that science currently knows uh, are believed to exist. And of course, over here, you can see now we have the familiar archangels and angels, intelligences and spirits. Our Milky Way, metaphorically, could be somewhere near the bottom here, and our little solar system on the speck edge of it could be here. They claim that there could be 49 parallel universes and 49 subdimensions within each one. That is definitely beyond my comprehension, but if that's true, and I believe it just might be, it gives you an idea of how vast these, these universes are. So last but not least is the worlds of Asaya. Asaya is a strange word also equal to the astral planes or the places where spirits and the angels and the disincarnate souls mix. And of course, we always hear in the religions something about the devil, right? Well, it may be a lot more complex than that. Most cultures on this world have always told about some spiritual war, very analogous to the Garden of Eden story, which is the Judeo-Christian lineage. and But most cultures talk about some spiritual war in heaven. And of course, these are the you know English versions, if you will, or 
Hebrew English versions of the fallen spirits. It's not just the devil. It's Lucifer, Satan, Belial, and Leviathan. And there's believe there's eight beneath that and legions upon legions beneath that. So this is very extremely vast stuff. And this last world, when we exit these bodies, also known as death, we will matriculate, it's believed, to somewhere in these 49 dimensions and 49 subdimensions of Asaya. Some of us will move on to other worlds and expand or grow. Others of us will go back and reincarnate repeatedly for God only knows literally how many times. And one of the mysteries of astrology is it seeks to unravel where we are in that chain of evolution. And Vedic astrology does give us quite a bit of insights into that. So why am I telling you all this? Not to give a theology lesson, but in your reading, I always tell people, not only is your Vedic astrology different from your tropical, but I believe that if our souls are created hundreds of dimensions above the rotating galaxies and the universe is, how could we possibly be our astrology? And that's where the ancient worlds of, you could say, the Egyptians, the Chaldeans, the Vedantic, and the Hebrew are, are maybe giving us a lot more insight that we are on a journey of the soul here, and we're spiritual beings having physical experiences. They claim the guardian angel from the Yetzirahic world ties the spirit, psyche, and soul to the embryo at conception, not at birth, by silver cord. And that nine months of gestation is the period we're supposedly in converse with these angels. Once we're tied into the body, which happens when we exit the room at first breath. So the birth chart really is timed, they say, by the angels to time these celestial influences and positions, which are infinite, way beyond sun signs. You have fixed stars, rotating galaxies. We will never fully ever know the mysteries behind this divine science of astrology completely. We get a lot from readings, but uh, astrologers have to realize that this is a very divine science and truly the code of the angels. I always say, forget Trinity, Neo, and Morpheus. This might truly be the matrix of the soul. So that's my introduction. I always love to tell people this, and this video hopefully will give you an introduction so I don't have to go through this every reading with everyone. And this gives you much insight. One last little riddle here on that. There's a little place called Cupid's bow that's at the top of your lip. And there's a mark that we all have between our nose and our upper lip. This is the mark that the angel is believed to make to block us so that our conscious mind, in the Hebrew, it's known as the nefesh, which actually starts forming in the womb, is not us. It's kind of like the keyboard, mouse, and screen we comport our computers with into these miraculous bodies. So our conscious mind, which is far, far more advanced than AI will ever be, um, is comporting through these miraculous bodies through something known as the lower nefesh. And the spirit, psyche, and soul is far senior to that. And this big thick dash line is believed to be the block that the angel makes with that mark to make us forget so that we live these lives with our own free will. So I hope this gives you help in readings. So you can listen to this again. It's a lot of information, and um, but it gives us some insights when we get our readings on how to maybe more deeply understand some of the mysteries and very sacred energies to these planets. Thank you for listening.